I want to bring you um, a message today out of Amos. But before I talk about that, I was just thinking about um, the way in which we communicate to each other as human beings, the way in which meaning occurs. And I guess for most in our society, and there are exceptions to that, of course, but the most common form of communication is verbal communication. But there are lots of other ways we communicate as well, isn't it? There's those non-verbal gestures such as the rolling of the eyes or the raising of the eyebrows or there's the tone of voice which may convey sarcasm which is one of my preferred means of communication. <laughs> and this is some of the problems with emails, isn't it? that you can't get those sort of non-verbal tone of voice across in emails. And, and just this week, I was, had to mediate something between two of my students where one of the students had said something tongue-in-cheek and, of course, that's not going to come across on an email. You can't see tongue-in-cheek on an email or you can't hear it. But, of course, there are other, there are other ways in which we communicate as well. A apart from those non-verbals, there is also illusion. It's all about the vibe. Now, those of you who snickered know what I'm talking about because you were clued into the illusion. You've seen that iconic Australian movie, The Castle, and so you know what the vibe means. But if you're not clued in, you don't. So communicating by illusion requires people to be clued into that. There are other ways as well. We communicate by implication. I could say, did you see the lunar eclipse last night? Not that there was one, but I'd say, did you see the lunar eclipse last night? You, you might answer, the sky was heavily overcast. Now, the implication is you didn't see it, but that's not what you said. You communicated that by implication. Now, there are implications in the biblical passages as well. I don't know how familiar you are with the book of Acts, but as... Luke, the author, talks about Paul's journeys. He will talk about, oh, Paul sailed along the coast of Asia. Um, and then suddenly it says, and we sailed from Troas. You think, hang on, we've gone from Paul to we. Who's the we? Well, the implication of that is that the author is a part-time travelling companion of Paul. And it drops in and out of the narrative. So Luke was obviously with Paul as part of his journey. So that's communicating by implication. One of the ways that we don't think about that we communicate is we communicate by structure. We, we communicate by the way that language is structured. As I said, we don't think about that much. But uh, I, look at a, I looked at a travel ad in a paper this week about, uh, what was it, eight, eight nights in Fiji for 1100 bucks. Of course, right down the bottom, is the really fine print that it's only valid for like two days in September or some of the ridiculous scenario. <laughs> uh, but, but what happens is, see, our society, we are clued in to think footnotes don't matter or, or the small print doesn't matter. And so what they do is you go eight nights in Fiji and you go, yeah, wouldn't it be great to go to Fiji? So you're already hooked and by the time you read the fine print, you don't care. You're going to go. It's not going to cost you 1100 it's going to cost you 2500 but that doesn't matter. And so the way that it's the structure of the communication has been very effective from a marketing point of view. Another way is our songs. We have, or a lot of songs, have verses and choruses. Now the chorus is repetitive because the chorus conveys the main point or the key point of the song. The structure conveys the message. And again we see that with the biblical material as well. Sticking with Acts for a moment, I don't know if you've noticed, but Luke has three accounts of Saul's conversion to Paul in Acts. Three accounts. Chapter 9, chapter 22, I think it's chapter 26. What's that say? It says it's important. The fact that you repeat something three times in the one narrative. Another instance I've actually got up on the slide is Hebrews. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole thing about the book of Hebrews, but the writer to the Hebrews wants to demonstrate that Jesus as God's son is the highest form of revelation that God can give. And in chapter 1, he has an extensive discussion where he compares Jesus to angels. 
and shows how Jesus is far superior to angels. And I've got that part up on the screen. The part in red is what he says about angels. The part in green is what he says about the sun. Now, the message not only comes from what he says about the sun, it's the amount of space he gives to them. The angels get two lines and the sun gets six verses. So structure conveys meaning. Okay? All right, let's get on to Amos, because that's really what I want to focus on. Um, I'm going to read a couple of verses from the start of Amos, and because it's two chapters and I want to preserve my voice, Rob's going to read the rest of it for us. So Amos chapter 1 uh, starts off, I've got this on my PowerPoint, I think, verse 1. Uh, the words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the land, sorry, in the days of King Uzziah of Judah and in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So Amos was a prophet who preached to Israel. Now, just a bit of uh, geography, uh, this period of time, which we can date with certainty because we're talking about kings, uh, etc., who are referenced in the book of Kings, it's about 760 BC. So, middle 8th century. And Amos is preaching to Israel. Now, you may not be aware, but at this point, there's a split in Israel between the north and the south. The north is called Israel, and there are 10 tribes out of the 12 in the north, and the south consists of one tribe, Judah. Benjamin, little tribe stuck between them, and that, that, uh, the area of Benjamin is always contested territory between the two. So you've got 11, uh, 10 tribes in the north called Judah, uh, sorry, start again, 10 tribes in the north called Israel and one tribe in the south called Judah. Amos is from Judah, but he's called by God to preach to the north, to preach to Israel. Verse 2 says, And he said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastor pastures of the shepherds wither and the top of Carmel dries up. That's Mount Carmel. Now you read that verse, you think, well, whatever God's going to say, it probably doesn't sound like it's going to be pleasant. The pastures of the shepherds wither and the top of Mount Carmel dries up. And what we have here in this following rest of chapter 1 and chapter 2 is a series of oracles that are delivered against the nations. So they're oracles of judgment. There are eight oracles in total, and they are nations who basically border Israel. So let's get Rob up, and he's going to read those out for us. Thanks, Rob. Uh, seat belts and hard hats on. <laughs> Amos chapter 1 and from verse 3. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. Because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth, I will send fire upon the house of Hazael that will consume the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. I will break down the gates of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden. The people of Aram will go into exile to Kerr, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom. I will send fire upon the walls of Gaza that will consume her fortresses. I will destroy the king of Ashdod, and the one who holds the scepter in Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron till the last of the Philistines is dead, says the Sovereign Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Tyre, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because she sold whole communities of captives to Edom, disregarding a treaty of brotherhood, I will send fire upon the walls of Tyre that will consume her fortresses. This is what the Lord says. 
For three sins of Edom, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because he pursued his brother with a sword, stifling all compassion, because his anger raged continually and his fury flamed unchecked, I will send fire upon Teman that will consume the fortresses of Bosra. This is what the Lord says, for three sins of Ammon, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because he ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to extend his borders. I will set fire to the walls of Rabbah that will consume her fortresses and war cries on the day of battle amid violent winds on a stormy day. Her kings will go into exile, he and his officials together, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Moab, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath because he burned as if to lime the bones of Edom's kings. I will send fire upon Moab, Moab that will consume the fortresses of Kerioth. Moab will go down in great tumult amid the war cries and the blast of the trumpet. I will destroy her ruler and kill all her officials with him, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees, because they have been led astray by false gods, the gods of their, the ancestors followed. I will send fire upon Judah that will consume the fortresses of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine and take fines. I destroyed the Amorite before them, though he was tall as the cedars and strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots below. I brought you up out of Egypt, and I led you 40 years in the desert to give you the land of the Amorites. I also raised up prophets from among your sons and Nazarites from among your young men. Is this not true, people of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. Now then, I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. The swift will not escape. The strong will not muster their strength. And the warrior will not save his life. The archer will not stand his ground. The fleet-footed soldier will not get away. And the horseman will not save his life. Even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day, declares the Lord. Amen. Now, bearing in mind what I've been talking about, the way we communicate through structure of language, let's look at the structure of the way those oracles are set up. Now, you'll probably see it more clearly if you're following along as Rob was reading, but even hearing it, you probably recognise that there was a, a recurring structure. So I'll put one of the oracles up, it doesn't matter which one, because they all repeat. Um, they all start off with a little introductory formula which says, thus says the Lord. In other words, the Lord is speaking through the prophet. Then what we have is a little poetic device that says, for three sins and for four. And the name of the city or the name of the people is introduced within that little poetic device. Then we have a statement of their sin. The statement of the sin starts with the word because. Then we have a statement of punishment that begins with the word so, normally it depends what English version you're reading, but normally begins with the word so. 
and promises the sending of fire. That's common to all the oracles. And fire is a common biblical image of judgment. And then most of the oracles conclude with another says the Lord or so says the Lord statement. Now I want you to think about the people as they heard this, these oracles of Amos. Where would he have preached them? Where would he have spoken them? Well, bear in mind he's in the north, so he's not at the temple. The temple's in the south. So the tribes of the north met at a central sanctuary in Bethel, in the town of Bethel. And Amos probably would have proclaimed these oracles at maybe the entrance to the meeting place in Bethel. How do you think they're feeling as he proclaims these oracles to the nations? I would think they're feeling pretty good. I would think they're feeling pretty good. There's no sense, bear in mind, there's no sense that Amos has actually gone to these nations and preaching to them. He's preaching here in the north and they're hearing this and they're pretty impressed, I would say, about God's judgment coming on these surrounding nations. But then the seventh oracle, for three sins of Judah. Hmm, well, that's a bit closer to home. But still we'll run with that. We're not that impressed with Judah. Israel and Judah had a number of clashes. So, yeah, okay, we'll live with that. But then Oracle 8 to Israel. Having got the audience on side, they suddenly get the unexpected. They weren't expecting an oracle to be delivered against them. But let's go back to the structure of the oracles and look what happens to the oracle to Israel. Well, we've got the same introductory formula, as says the Lord. We have the same poetic introduction for three sins for four. And then we have the statement of the crime or the indictment, let's call it starting with because. You notice what's different with the because section? That's it all, it's all in green. Now in the other oracles, the because section goes for two lines, half a verse. Here, one, two, three, four, five, six verses of indictment. What about the punishment section? In the other oracles, it was two verses, here it's four, it's doubled. And not only that, there's a little section in verses 9 to 11, which I'll just read out again. Yet I destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and who was as strong as oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. I brought you up of the land of, out of the land of Egypt and led you for 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorites. And I raised up some of your children to be your prophets, and some of your youths to be Nazarites. Is it not indeed so, O people of Israel? That little section has no comparison in the other oracles. And what it is, is a statement of what God has done for that nation. And what that does is actually heighten the crime. That heightens the indictment. And so their indictment section is way longer than the other oracles, and their punishment section is twice as long. What's that say? Well, it says this. Sin is more serious for those who should know better. Sin is more serious for those who should know better. God had shown grace to Israel. They were in a covenant relationship with him, but they hadn't responded appropriately. And that's a powerful message, I think, for those who know God and have experienced his blessing. Israel their guilt outweighed the guilt of the other nations because they should have known better. Sin is serious. Sin's not a popular topic today. It's not a popular topic in our world and it's probably not a pop popular topic in the church. And it's that unpopular, I thought long and hard about whether I should even speak on it. Sin smacks of external authority. And people don't like external authority in our society. But we sit here today as a privileged people, don't we? A privileged people who are saved by grace just as Israel were. We need to be careful of caricatures of law and grace. Sometimes people caricature the Old Testament as a, as a testament of law and the New Testament 
as all about grace. That's not only simplistic, it's probably wrong. I mean, Israel was saved by grace. God brought them out of Egypt. The law, the covenant was something they agreed to keep. There's grace shown to Israel just as there have been to the people of God as well. And I believe the message of Amos is still a very much relevant message for the people of God today as well. And that is, don't treat God's grace lightly. Sin is a problem and it needs to be dealt with. Now, of course, we have the role of the cross and forgiveness. And that, that operates in much the same way, although in a much more effective way, of course, than the sacrificial system within Israel. Israel had a means of atoning, of dealing with sin, and that was through the daily sin offering and through the once-a-year day of atonement. But we have the cross, which is once for all put to death or put, to, put an end to all that repeated sacrifice, and the book of Hebrews goes into that at length and says that Christ has offered himself once for all to effectively deal with sin. And so we have a couple of really important verses for us, and I've just put a couple from John, uh, 1 John, to show the significance of that. that first of all, it says that um, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So there's an acknowledgement that we sin. But also there's a promise that if, if, we forget our, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not that God decides to forgive us, that he's just to forgive us. In other words, he would be unjust not to. You think, well, how can that be? Because his son has been offered as the perfect sacrifice. So it's, he's just in forgiving us. And then it goes on at the start of verse two. Uh, chapter 2 there, to say that um, I'm writing these things to you so that if we do sin, we know we we have an advocate with the Father, um, Jesus Christ. So there is no need for guilt for sin that is confessed to God. And I I want to stress that really strongly. There is no need for guilt for sin that is confessed to God. But sin that is ignored or sin that is glossed over as it was in Israel's case, is a real problem. We all know that sin carries with it the pleasures of a season, but it always catches up with you. And the the thing with sin is it's so subtle. Uh, Its dangers are not always that clearly apparent. And sometimes it's not even obvious what's going on. And sometimes we might not even think that our sin is much of a problem. But there are dangers with sin, and I just want to talk briefly through a few of the dangers that I thought about when I thought about sin. And those dangers manifest themselves in a number of different ways. Uh, The first way, uh, and this is picking up Hebrews, because I'm speaking, I'm I'm teaching Hebrews this semester, so that's why Hebrews is at the forefront of my mind. Hebrews pictures a trajectory, and the trajectory goes like this. Sin becomes willful sin, which becomes neglect of spiritual things and neglect of God, which becomes apostasy. There's a trajectory from sin to willful sin to just to being lethargic, neglecting, to then giving away the faith. Not many people wake up and say, I think I'll give Christianity away today. That's not how it works. People just drift off. As Hebrews 2 1 says, therefore let us pay greater attention to what we've heard lest we drift away. Uh, I'm a, I do a lot of fishing. My son's actually insanely into fishing. And uh, over our summer holidays, we went to Naruma and we, did a, we went on a fishing charter. And we started off out near Montague Island. I don't know if you know Naruma, it's about eight k's off the coast. And we're there. Suddenly, within 10 minutes, we have drifted and the island is like three kilometres away. The current was so strong, we had no idea how far we drifted. And it's like that with our faith, isn't it? You can just drift without realising it. You can get to a certain point without really grasping that. The second danger with sin is that sin stunts growth. 
Now, those of you who do know me well know me that I'm a, a, lawn, ex I'm a f lawn freak. I love growing my lawn. I've, I've, grown, I've grown cooch lawn as a hobby for over 30 years. <laughs> and the reason for that is I'm a, golf, I'm a golf fanatic and I love the aesthetics of a, of a golf course. The amount of people that stop out my front lawn, I've had people knock on my door and say, where did you get your fake grass from? Which I consider the greatest insult of all time. <laughs> I even had one person stop and say, um, is that fake grass, as I was mowing it. <laughs> I just looked at this bloke, are you serious? <laughs> anyway, this year I had significant problems with my cooch lawn and I had suddenly yellow spots over it. I thought, okay, it needs a bit of fertiliser, put some fertiliser on it. Watered it, nothing happened. Okay, so I aerated it, nothing happened. Okay, there's something more serious going on here. So I sent it off to a friend of mine who's into sports turf and they did a chemical analysis. It turns out I've got three different types of fungus disease in it. It was never going to grow. No amount of fertiliser, no amount of water it wasn't going to overcome the problem. I need this really volatile mix of antifungicides apparently to fix this thing up, which now I've got to wait till all winter's over before I can apply it. But the message of that is, is really the same as talking about sin, isn't it? Uh, unless you deal with it, with your, the root problem, you're not going to overcome the problem. And I've got a verse from 1 Peter here up on the screen. Uh, Rid yourselves therefore of all malice, I'll just turn around so I haven't got it in front of me, uh, and all guile, insincerity, envy and all slander, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk so that by, by it you may grow into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. In other words, you must rid yourselves of the problem in order for growth to occur. I've got to rid my lawn of the fungus if it's ever going to grow again. So the, pre, the prerequisite for growth in the Christian life is getting rid of the stuff that shouldn't be there. And that's a common theme across a number of New Testament books, isn't it? Uh, sin also damages relationships. There's many uh, family relationships, aren't there, which are, are dysfunctional. And sin, I think, in some way, is at the heart of most of those dysfunctional relationships. Also, community relationships. I mean, how many churches have we seen, and I know of one playing out right now, which is it was devastating where Christian communities are being fractured and torn apart by people who want to preserve tradition or power at any cost. Sin also brings shame to the name of Jesus. And the perception of those outside the Christian community, of the Christian community, is not always that positive, is it? And there are many reasons for that, and sometimes it's deserved, whether it be child abuse scandals, financial scandals, sexual scandals or whatever. But it certainly seems to me like these days Christianity is the horse that needs to be flogged, it would appear. But those things that people are picking up not only harm the church, they also dishonour the name of Jesus. And whether we like it or not, we're ambassadors for Christ. And our lives are under scrutiny. And the way we live can have a positive or a negative effect on the gospel. Sin also lowers productivity for the kingdom of God. One of the things I said to my kids when they were very young, I said, guys, you are not just on this planet to breathe the air. You're here to make a difference. God has put you here to make a difference so that when you leave this place, in some way, it's a better place than before you came. And that was a message I'd give, I'd give to you today, that you're not just here to breathe the air. You're here to make a difference. Yes, God can use people despite their sinfulness, but sin is a distraction and will ultimately, I think, undermine a person's effectiveness for God in the world, particularly if that sin is embraced willingly. Um, again, Hebrews, Hebrews 12.1, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything 
that hinders and sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. That image of sin so easily entangling. I go for a morning, a, a walk every morning. I get up at quarter to six and at this time of year that's not pleasant because it's dark. And there's this little part, most of it's reasonably lit, but there's this little place I go that joins two uh, roads and it's very dark and overhanging that section is a lot of gum trees and you get a lot of branches falling and bark falling and there are numerous times there I've nearly gone flat on my face because of branches that get tangled in my feet. Well, that's, that's, that's what sin's like, isn't it? Sin so easily entangles you and prevents you, in my case it's walking, but the image here is from running the race effectively. And sin also impacts our standing in the life to come. Now, we don't get much on the nature of the life to come in the New Testament. Certainly we're told there is a life to come, there is a resurrection, there is that eternal life. But a lot of the images are elusive as to what that life will be like. I certainly believe it's, there's evidence to think that it's a, some sort of physical type existence on a new earth. That's where it seems to point. But the details of that are often... Or well, they're not gone into a lot. But the New Testament does speak on a number of occasions about rewards for God's people. And sometimes that's in the form of parable, which makes it difficult to sort out, you know, how, what is being referred to. Uh, but there is an undeniable link between the way you live your life here and your standing in the life to come, whatever form that life's going to take. Now, a word of clarification here, because I don't want you to misconstrue this, but rewards don't equate to salvation we're talking about two different things here we don't earn our salvation you don't earn your relationship with god um, and rewards should not be a motive for christian service rewards are not your motive for serving god but they're a byproduct of it and the motive for god should be love and gratitude but and it's really hard to maintain an eternal perspective isn't it but that's the thing that separates Christian from non-Christian, is that we have an eternal hope, an eternal perspective. We have a hope that goes beyond what we have in the present. And that perspective, that eternal perspective, should govern the way we live now. Uh, I'm jumping all over the New Testament here, but a verse from 1 John. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we'll be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed... We will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So the ethical commandment, the command to be pure, springs from motivation about what's to come. Okay? That's important. About, well, probably a year to two years ago, I prayed a prayer that I regretted. Up until I remember having a conversation with my wife Anne Marie, and we we're talking about self esteem. And I remember saying to her a while ago, I said, I've never had a problem with self esteem. I've, I've always you know, been happy with myself. Well, after praying this prayer, I didn't feel like that anymore. In fact, I'm still not quite sure I do. My self esteem took an absolute battering. And the prayer I prayed, was along the lines of I recognised there were some things in my life that weren't that good um, and I won't go into it ex extensively but it evolved around being very angry and irrationally angry at sport to the extent you'd want to go up and thump an umpire and stuff like that now I know you think how could he possibly be that and I admit that anger, I am not an angry person, but you put me in a sporting environment and things changed. And I didn't like that. And I remember speaking to someone at MST, um, the student councils there, and I said, look, I'm seeing this in my life, I just don't like it. She said, why don't you pray to God that he would show you the root causes of the problem? And that was the prayer that I prayed. I've got to tell you, if ever you want a quick answer to a prayer, pray that one. <laughs> because God wants to show you the things that are hindering growth, 
And God wants to show you your sin, not to condemn you, but to give you freedom from it. But I was able to see a number of root causes of what's going on here, and I'm going, wow. And I was a very unhappy person as a result of that. And I said my self-esteem took a battering, and it was very difficult. But it was an avenue to a great appreciation for God, and it was an avenue to a source of growth and potential transformation because you're still working through these things. Um, But it was interesting to say the least and devastating really to see the extent of what goes behind the things that manifest themselves in an outward sense in our lives. And I guess I'd like to leave you with this challenge. Are you willing to pray a prayer like that? Because there's a prayer that will be answered, but it may not be pleasant initially. Forgiveness is easy. Jesus has died. God wants to forgive. God is the God of second chance. I don't know if you've ever realised that, but you look at the people in Scripture who have had second chances. Moses, David, Peter, Simon Peter, just to name a few. Forgiveness is easy. God will forgive. But eradicating sin is not always that easy. You're going to need God's help. And you may well need the help of others, others in the Christian community. You may even need specialist help, people who are skilled in that area of counselling. But I would encourage you that if God is speaking to you today, that you need to get to the starting blocks. And this is not a message of condemnation, because I'm speaking from one who is alongside. Uh, It's a message of encouragement. I know it's Mother's Day, and you might think, what's this got to do with Mother's Day? Well, the only link I can draw, and it's very tenuous, (laughs) is that there's no mother who has ever been born that can deny the doctrine of original sin. We all know that we don't have to teach anyone to be bad, that there's something fundamentally in the way we are wired as human beings that causes us to sin. But God has dealt with it. He's dealt with our sin and if there's something in your life that is just, you know is there and it needs to be dealt with, God wants to deal with it. There's no condemnation. He wants to deal with it and he wants to free you. There was a man who used to go for a regular walk through a new housing estate and being interested in gardening, he took great interest in the way people prepared their gardens, their new gardens, ready to plant. Going by the first house, he saw a man who was energetically scalping weeds off the top of the ground with a spade. Passed by another house and he saw a woman down on her hands and knees really meticulously plucking out each weed separately, but she was breaking off many at the top. Passed by another house a few houses down and saw a woman and her son laying newspaper out over the weeds and then putting mulch over the top. The last house he saw, he saw a man spraying weeds with Roundup. Now passing by that house a few weeks later, he saw those weeds had died and the man was hoeing the soil ready to plant. I'll leave you with that.